Hello everyone. Today I'll be trying something a bit different. I'll be attempting a live solve of the AMC 12A from this year. As you can see, there's already a timer running. Um, and the little bit of extra time at the start is just for me to give you a brief introduction about the AMC in case you have not heard of it before or you are not too familiar with how the format is like. Now the American Map Contest, um, there are three categories of it, AMC 8, 10 and 12, meant for grade 8, 10 and 12 respectively. Um, it would vaguely be comparable to the junior, senior and open categories in Singapore, although the format is rather different. Now the AMC 8 is really different, so I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, the AMC 10 and 12 um, have 25 questions to be solved in 75 minutes. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that the format is 6 marks for a correct answer, 1.5 marks for a blank, and 0 marks if you get incorrect. In other words, you can't just uh, randomly guess if you're unsure because all of them are MCQ. But if you were to guess randomly, you would get an expected value of 1.2 marks per question, whereas 1.5 marks is given for a blank. Now the AMC 10 and 12 um, lead to the AIME which then leads to the USAMO, which is the most, uh, which is the highest level Olympiad in the USA. All right, so in terms of what kind of score is good, um, I did a quick check for the 2021 uh, AMC 12A, which I'm doing. Uh, the AIME cutoff is 93. So uh, to get 93, you would need something like, uh, let's say if you have 13 correct and 12 blank, uh, that would be 78 for the correct answers and then 18 for the blank. So you would get 96. So if you did 13 correct and you were really sure and you left everything blank, uh, that would have been enough for you to get into the AIMB. Um, I should also emphasize that this is not known beforehand. Uh, so you don't know what's the cutoff, uh, they only tell you beforehand that it is either 100 or the top 5%. Usually it ends up being a bit lower than 100 um, and depending on the paper it would be something like 80 something or 90 something. One more thing to say is that there is also the 12A and 12B as well as the 10A and 10B. These are the same difficulty just different dates. Um, the reason is mainly logistical. Uh, firstly, in case you can't make it for one day, you can go for the other one. And secondly, the AMC 10 is also held over two days. So some students might want to take the AMC 10A and 12B or the 12A and 10B. And so you can take both by them uh, organizing it on two different days. Okay, so I see I have about uh, 20 seconds left till the 75 minute mark. Now this is a live solve, meaning that uh, I haven't tried the problems in advance, uh, but admittedly I have copied the questions over, which means I may have taken a quick glance at them along the way, but I have tried my best not to think about it too much in advance. So we'll see whether I can complete it in the time. And here we go. Question one, uh, what is the value of this expression? Well, we can just calculate it directly. So 2 to the power of 6 is 64. Uh, 2 plus 4 plus 8 is 14. And so 64 minus 14 is 50. I'm not going to explain too much. I'm just going to talk out my thoughts out loud. Question 2. Under what conditions is square root a squared plus b squared equals to a plus b true? And let's square both sides. And so if we cancel everything, uh, 2ab equals to 0, uh, ab equals to 0 is the condition. Okay. Now, ab equals to 0 is a sufficient condition but not necessarily enough because uh, this means that a equals to 0 or b equals to 0. Uh, but if a equals to 0, 
then you get something like root b squared equals to b, which is only true if b is greater than or equals to zero. And uh, likewise, uh, if b equals to zero, you know that a has to be greater than or equal to zero. So either way, it means that a plus b has to be positive, which makes sense because the square root of anything has to be greater than or equals to zero. So I would say the answer is option D. Question three. The sum of two natural numbers is 17402. Uh, one of the two numbers is divisible by 10. If the unit's digit of that number is erased, so that number is divisible by 10, uh, we can call it 10x. If you cut off that zero, then you get x. So it means that 11x, which is the sum, is 17402. Now, uh, this would be 1582 for the value of x. And then I want to find 9x. 9x, I just checked the unit's digit, it should be d already. So I'll assume this is correct without having to do any multiplication. Question 4. Tom has a collection of 13 snakes, 4 of which are purple and 5 of which are happy. Uh, he observes that all his happy snakes can add, none of his purple snakes can subtract, and all of his snakes that can't subtract also can't add. Okay, this is a bit strange. Um, let's see. Uh, so purple and happy are not necessarily um, mutually exclusive. Uh, what it says is that if you're happy, means you can add. If purple means can't subtract and can't subtract implies can't add. Now if you can't add means you can't have been happy and that's the contrapositive but you can just think of it as if you're happy you can add. So if you can't add means you must not have been happy. Okay, so let's see, this means that purple snakes can't add, can't subtract, and are not happy. So let's look at the conclusions. Uh, purple snakes can add, nope. Uh, purple snakes are happy, nope. Snakes that can add are purple, no. Uh, happy snakes are not purple, uh, yes, because if they were purple, they are not happy. Right? And happy snakes can't subtract, doesn't say anything about that. So option D should be correct. Question 5. When a student multiplied the number 66 by the repeating decimal, 1.ABAB A, B, and so on, where AB are digits, he did not notice the notation and just multiplied 166 times 1.AB. Okay, so 1.AB repeated is actually 1 and AB over 99. 1.AB without the repetition is 1 and AB over 100. So the difference is AB times 1 over 99 minus 1 over 100, which is AB times 1 over 9900. Okay, so now the multiplication by 66, we can also multiply the difference by 66. So 66 over 9900 times AB is supposed to be 0 0.5. 66 over 9900, 100 times this is 6600, so 9900 would be 150 times this. So AB over 150 equals to 0 0.5 and AB is 75. Question 6. I'm doing this as a live solve to show how uh, I would approach it in a competition, but it's probably a bit fast for you to keep up if you are not comfortable at this pace. So please feel free to stop the video, pause a while, and uh, catch your breath, um, and comment below if you have any questions um, after seeing all of this. Okay, question 6. A deck of cards has only red and black cards. The probability of a randomly chosen card being red is one third. So which means that you have one third red and two thirds will be black. Now you plus four black, it means that now you have uh, one quarter 
red and three quarter black. Okay, so um, I guess I can let the number of uh, red cards be x, uh, and this was two x. Now here, the number of red is still x, but the number of black has become three x. So that means x equals to four, and the original three x equals to twelve. Question 7. What's the least possible value of xy minus 1 squared plus x plus y squared? Okay, so this is a bit more interesting. Hmm. Okay, so the first thing that is coming to my mind is uh, let's try uh, 0, 0 as kind of a benchmark. Uh, and then it would give me, well, 1 plus 0. Now, other than that, I'm really not sure. So let me try to expand it and see whether it gives me anything. So x squared y squared minus 2xy plus 1 plus x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Oh, okay. So 2xy cancels out. That's nice. So this is x squared y squared plus x squared plus y squared plus 1. Ah, that is factorizable. Okay, so that means that my original guess is correct. Uh, x equals to 0, y equals to 0 would give you the minimum, which is 1. Okay. Question 8. A sequence of numbers is defined... Uh, okay, so this is kind of... Uh, weird Fibonacci sequence where you skip a number. Okay, so you get uh, 0, 0, 1 and then after that you take 0 plus 1 to give you 1, 0 plus 1 to give 1 again, then 1 plus 1 gives you 2, 1 plus 2 gives you 3, 1 plus 3 gives you 4, 2 plus 4 gives you 6, 3 plus 6 gives you 9. Okay, so this, uh, let's see whether there's any pattern since they ask you for parities. This is even, even, odd, 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 even, odd, even, even, odd. Okay, so it looks like there's already a pattern here, right? Because um, the two evens repeated again. So it's even, even, odd, 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 even, odd, and then you repeat uh, every seven terms. Okay, let me just check my addition again. Uh, this is... Alright, it seems fine. So 20, 21 uh, divided by 7. Uh, I like to remember that 1001 is a multiple of 7. So 2002 is also a multiple of 7 and I can minus that off to give me the remainder is 5. And so the remainder is 5. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, and 7. So these are the three that would correspond to the remainders 5, 6, and 7. And that is option C. Okay, question 9. Uh, which of the following is equivalent to this? 2 plus 3, 2 squared plus 3 squared, 2 to the 4. Okay, uh, all of the powers are powers of 2 themselves. It's doubling every time, and I hope to be able to expand it somehow. Now, the easiest way to do that would be to try to use our difference of squares factorization, uh, and I would introduce in a factor of 3 minus 2. Uh, the factor of 3 minus 2 is harmless because there's actually 1, uh, but it means that these two can be combined into 3 squared minus 2 squared, uh, and then these two can be combined to 3 to the 4 minus 2 to the 4, uh, you can combine this uh, and so on. So you will just keep combining all the way until 3 to the 1 to 8 minus 2 to the 1 to 8, uh, which is option C, which I have accidentally written over. Okay, good. So we are making good time. Question 10. Two right circular cones with vertices facing down, as shown in the figure below, contain the same amount of liquid. Okay. Um, the radius of the tops of the liquid surfaces are 3 cm and 6 cm. Into each cone is dropped a spherical marble of radius 1. 
uh, which sinks to the bottom and is completely submerged without spilling any liquid. Okay. Uh, what's the ratio of the rise of the liquid level in the narrow cone to the rise of the liquid level in the wide cone? Okay, this is interesting. So we have to use the same amount of liquid and we also have to use the fact that um, there are spherical marbles which I think it's not so important to find all the areas, especially at question 10, um, all the volumes I should say are probably too tedious. Um, we should say that this is the same uh, volume before and after. Okay, so if the same volume before and after, uh, I want to know how does the height compare before and the height compare after. And since the shape is going to be the same for both of them, um, it is always going to be that the radius of this one is half of the radius of the other wider one. Okay, so let's check uh, if let's say for this one, uh, I call the original height uh, h1 and the original height h2. So we know that the volume is one third pi r squared h. So this is three pi h1, and this is six squared times h2 is twelve pi times h2. Okay, so that means that these two are equal. So h1 equals to four times of h2. Now, after that, you add a little bit more volume. But if you add a little bit more volume, um, it's still going to be the same ratio, right? Uh, so which means that you're just, um, you're just scaling it up. And if you're scaling it up, this is the change. The new heights should also be in the same ratio as the old heights because the radii are also going to be in the same ratio. So we can say that the ratio should still be 4 is to 1. At least that's the intuition which I have and I hope it's correct. We'll check the answers later at the end and if I did anything silly, we'll think through why is it I did it wrongly, perhaps in too much of a hurry. I will move on first. Uh, question 11. A laser is placed at the point 35. So there's a point here. Uh, Larry wants the beam to hit and bounce off the y axis and then hit and bounce off the x axis and then hit the point 75. Okay, uh, so somewhere here. Um, I think I should move things a little bit up. So. Uh, because I have a sense that we are going to be moving things around quite a bit. So it's going to bounce off. Uh, I guess something like this, then this, and then this. That's what you want. And all the angles are going to be equal. And 3, 5 and 7, 5 have the same height, same y coordinate, so I'll just draw that in as well. Okay, so this, uh, this length is 4, uh, this length is 3, and this length is 5. Okay. Now, let me see. Uh, we are supposed to find the total distance that the beam will travel along this path. Uh, so one way we can do it is to reflect the points over to make them more straight lines. Right, so 3, 5, I first reflect it over to be minus 3, 5. And this will still be a straight line, even though my drawing is pretty lousy. Um, and then after that, um, this can be reflected over. And uh, I guess I have no space. I'm just going to pretend that this is the reflection over to minus 3 minus 5. OK, 
Okay, so if this is minus 3 minus 5, then what's the total distance traveled? Um, actually, you realize that this distance is also equal to this, and then this is 2 times of that. So I've not changed the distance if I just find the straight line. I find the straight line distance from here to here, which I have clearly not drawn as a straight line, that distance would be the total distance traveled by the path, by the beam along the path. Okay, so the distance from minus 3 minus 5 to 7, 5 um, is square root of 10 squared plus 10 squared. Oh, there is 10 square root 2, which is option C. Question 12, um, all the roots of the polynomial, okay, this is a degree 6 polynomial and they are positive integers. Um, they have given me minus 10 and 16 as the only two coefficients. Okay, okay so this means that the Vieta's formulas tell us that the product of roots equals to 16 and the sum of roots is equal to 10. Now uh, let's see how this can happen. Um, 16 is 2 to the 4. So, ah, okay, so 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 1 times 1 would give me a product of 10. Sorry, a sum of 10. Uh, I don't think there's another way to do it. Uh, but anyway, um, this is an AMC question, so if this is one combination, it has to give you the correct value of B. Okay, so this would now become uh, your roots. Um, so they've given me Z, I'll use Z as the variable. Uh, Z minus 2 to the 4 times Z minus 1 squared. So use the binomial theorem. So in my mind, I'm thinking of 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, and then I am just multiplying by the correct number of 2's. Okay, so the next one is 6 times 2 squared. Then after that, 4 times 2 cubed. And then 1 times 2 to the 4. This is z squared minus 2z plus 1. Uh, how do we get z cubed? Uh, you have got 3 combinations that do that for you. Okay, so minus 8, minus 48, minus 32 uh, is minus 88. Okay, question 13. Of the following complex number z, which one has the property that z to the power of 5 has the greatest real part? Okay, um, Ah, okay. So I'm seeing that uh, all of these have have modulus or magnitude two. If we realize that, okay, because root three and one, you sum the squares is four. Then you square root four is two. Um, square root two and square root two, um, you square both of them. You get two plus two is four. You square root that's two. So all of them. Have the same length too. Uh, what we want is the so we want the argument which is closest to zero. So on your argon diagram, you want something that's pointing here. Uh, you do not want something that's pointing here, here, or here. Right. And all of these have pretty nice uh, values, such I think we can find the argument. Um, I'm going to use degrees here. I think it's easier for some of us to think in degrees, but if you prefer radians, go ahead. So minus 2 uh, is 180 degrees, so it's pointing to the left. Uh, i minus square root 3. Okay, so minus square root 3 plus i would be somewhere here. Uh, square root 3 and 1. So this would be 30 degrees, so the argument is 150 degrees. Okay. Then the next one, 
um, square root 2 minus square root 2 that is somewhere here so this is 135 degrees because it is just equal uh, the next one minus 1 and square root 3i so this is 1 and square root 3 and this angle is 30 degrees so 30 plus 90 is 120 and finally 2i is pointing up so that's 90 degrees okay so let's multiply all of them by 5 uh, 900 degrees 750 degrees um, 675 degrees 600 degrees and uh, 450 degrees um, and then I'm going to shift them to between minus 90 and 90 um, so that we can compare them as easily as possible so this uh, sorry not minus 90 minus 180 and 180 so this is going to be 180 degrees uh, this is 30 degrees seems promising uh, minus 45 degrees uh, minus 120 degrees and 90 degrees okay so the one that is closest to zero is this one which corresponds to this which corresponds to this okay so that saves me the time of actually cubing them although now that i know the argument um, sorry fifth powers um, it's not very difficult to find the fifth powers since we have already computed everything out with modulus and argument but that should be correct so let's move on question 14 uh, what is the value of oh this is a big mess but um, probably not so bad because um, we have 5 and 3 here and then 9 and 25 are just the squares of 3 and 5 okay, so I'll deal with each of these separately uh, I'm sure it can be simplified in some way so I'll use a change of base oops I should write it a bit more neatly shouldn't I 3 to the k squared so using a change of base this is a log of 3 to the k squared over log 5 to the k and k squared comes out uh, k comes out it cancels so you get k times of log base 5 of 3 okay, so now I can do the other one uh, log 9 to the k of 25 to the k uh, we use the change of base again again I see the factor of k coming out but 25 and 9 are 5 squared and 3 squared so this is log base 3 of 5 okay so now that we have found this uh, that's great uh, it's pretty easy to add them up the first one is going to be the sum of k times of log base 5 of 3 so you sum from 1 to 20 log 5 3 the other one, uh, they're all the same, so it's just 100 times of log 3, 5. Okay, the sum from 1 to 20 is 20 times 21 over 2, which is equal to 210. So it's 210 times 100, and then log 5, 3 and log 3, 5 are just reciprocals because uh, we can use a change of base. That means you're left with 210 times 100 which is 21,000 okay question 15 now at this point uh, if you have done 14 questions correctly uh, if we are sure those are correct which I'm mostly sure uh, 14 times 6 is 84 and then the other 11 questions if you leave them blank that is 16.5 so in total if all of them are correct you get 100.5 which uh, guarantees your qualification into the AIME and I guess we are making good time uh, we've taken less than 30 minutes for that um, this is not especially fast uh, if we are talking about uh, some of the students who are trying to get a perfect score or near perfect score for the AMCs because the ones behind as we will see take 
exponentially more time than the ones in front. So you almost have to blast through the first half if you want to get a really high score. But if you're trying to just get a qualification mark, you can afford to do it at a far slower pace than what I've done here. So maybe if I do the AMC 12B uh, in the next video, uh, I might do it at a so-called uh, teaching pace <laughs> instead of at a solving pace, which is what I'm doing now. Anyway, let's continue. Question 15. A uh, choir director must select a group of singers from among his six tenors and eight basses. The only requirements are that the difference between the number of tenors and basses must be a multiple of four, and the group must have at least one singer. So the difference must be a multiple of four. Uh, I don't see much other option than just uh, listing them, right? So you have got... Okay, I guess we can uh, save a bit of time uh, by just grouping them into uh, zero, one, two, and three mod four. So zero and four, one and five, two and six, and three. Uh, and then for this one, uh, you can have zero, four, and eight, uh, one and five, two and six, three and seven. Okay, so if I want to pick from the first category, I have six through zero, six through four, for the zero mod four from the tenors, and then eight through zero plus eight through four plus eight through eight from the bases. And I think I have no reason not to calculate this because three of these five are one. So this is one plus uh, fifteen. This is one plus uh, what's this? Seventy plus one. So 16 times 72. Uh, that is equal to, we can just double 72 four times. I think that's easier. So uh, 144, 288, 576, and then 1152. Um, actually, we only need the 52 at the back since it's divided by 100, but never mind since I've already calculated it. Okay, so we can continue with the others as well. Uh, 6 choose 1 and 6 choose 5. And then uh, 8 choose 1 and 8 choose 5. Uh, this is 6 and 6. Uh, this is 8 and uh, 8 choose 5 is 8 choose 3. That's 8 times 7 times 6 over 3 factorial. So 8 times 7 is 56. Okay, so this is 12 times 64. Um, 64 times 10, 640 plus 128, so 768. Okay, the next case uh, is the choose 2 and choose 6. So as a general tip, uh, if you can think of a method that doesn't require you to do more than a few calculations, um, probably that method is good enough. Right? We don't have to really think so hard about whether there is a smarter way to do it. Perhaps there is, but this is quicker. So 6 choose 2 is 15 plus 1. Um, 8 choose 2 and 8 choose 6 are the same. So 28 and 28. And this is 16 times 56 this time. Again, I can double 56 4 times. So 112, 224, 448, and then 896. The last one, uh, 6 choose 3 times uh, 8 choose 3 plus 8 choose 7, uh, 6 choose 3, uh, 20, 8 choose 3 is the same as 8 choose 5, we already calculated that, so it's 20 times 64 this time, ah, so I'm seeing the trick here actually, uh, which is that uh, these two are the same, so we can group that, and these two are the same, so we actually could have grouped those, okay, but uh, Things okay, the calculation wasn't too bad. Okay, so now we just need to add the last two digits 52 plus 68, 120, uh, that's 20. 20 plus 96, 116, I take 16. 16 plus 80 
is 96. Uh, and then there's the option there which is 95. When I see something like that, I'm thinking, is there a trap? And it says that the group must have at least one singer. So my 0 and 0 uh, has to be eliminated. Right, so that's a nasty trick that they put in. Uh, but 96 minus 1, 95. So that should be the correct answer for this. Okay, question 16. In the following list of numbers, the integer n appears n times in the list for n from 1 to 200. And what's the median of the numbers in this list? Okay, uh, I just need to figure out where it happens. Uh, and from 1 to 200, uh, how many numbers are there? Uh, so the 200 times 201 over 2 is 20100. Okay, so there are an even number of numbers. So I should divide by 2 and say that I want the 10050 and the 1005 first term. And I take the average. Okay, so I need to figure out what number is the 10,050th term in this list. Um, I guess we know that we can make some estimate. Um, the hundredth, uh, from 1 to 100 would be 5050. So I want something where the number times itself plus 1 over 2 is around 10,000, means the number squared is around 20,000. So 140 seems like a decent place to start. So if I do 240, this is uh, 70 times 141 is uh, 9870. Okay, so uh, if I add plus 141, this would be uh, 10,011. Uh, so I should add another one. So plus 142, I get 10153. Okay, so that's uh, 10,050 and 10,051 are well between these two. So I know that it must be both 142. Okay, and there is an option, so probably we are correct. Okay, next one. Is this the first real geometry question we had? I, but oh yeah, there was the reflecting of light rays one. Yeah, but otherwise it seems like the first geometry question. Uh, let's write this down. Uh, this is a trapezium, trapezoid. Um, two of the sides are equal and there's a right angle. Okay, so I'm going to... Is that the side? No, BD is a diagonal. Okay, so I'm going to try to draw a diagram first. Uh, it's probably going to be wrong and then I'll adjust it from there. Okay, so C, D, B, and A, AD is perpendicular to BD. Okay, this is not terrible. I guess I shall try to draw a bit more perpendicular looking ADB. And then I will put in C such that this works out. Okay, so this seems okay. And I'll erase the one on top. Let O be the intersection of the diagonals. Okay, let's draw in the diagonal. And P be the midpoint of BD. Given that OP equals to 11, the length of AD can be written in the form M root N. Okay, so find AD is the question. Right, uh, let's write everything down. We have got 43 and 43 and OP is 11. So I guess I see an isosceles triangle and then I see a midpoint uh, P and I see another right angle. So what I want to do is I'm going to draw in the perpendicular from C to P. Now because of the trapezium uh, having parallel lines, uh, we know that there are equal angles here and here. 
So I can say that uh, triangle CPD is similar to triangle um, ADB. Okay. So let's um, put that down and then we'll see what else we can do. Uh, and I will draw them out because my diagram seems a little bit too messy. Okay, this is not much better, but it should do. So I know there's 43 here. And then there is uh, ABD. P is the midpoint also, which means that PD is half of DB. So the ratio is 1 is to 2. Uh, that means that this is going to be 86. And if that's 86, it means that I have the other pair of similar triangles, triangle COD and triangle AOB. And they are in the ratio 1 is to 2, meaning that DO to OB is 1 is to 2. So I label this as uh, X and the whole thing is 2X. Uh, it means that DO to OB uh, would be 2 third X. Uh, this is going to be 4 over 3 X. Um, BP is X, so OP is one third X, which is 11. So X is 33. Okay, so last thing, uh, we need to find AD. Uh, I'm going to just use the smaller triangle. And then after that, multiply by 2 to scale it up. So CP is the root of 43 squared minus 33 squared. Using difference of squares, this is 76 times 10. So I can factor out a 4 uh, root 190. Sorry, 2 root 190. Um, and then 190 is yeah, 19 times 10. We can't simplify anymore. Um, and AD is twice of that. 4 root 190. And uh, that means that M is 4, N is 190. M plus N is 194. If you're feeling like this is a humongous mess, uh, my handwriting's all over the place, you're quite right. Uh, that is often how this goes when you're solving questions really quick. Okay, uh, next one. Let f be a function defined on the set of positive rational numbers with the property that f of a times b equals to f of a plus f of b for all positive rational numbers a and b. Um, suppose that f also has the property that f of p equals to p for any prime number p uh, for which of the numbers x is fx less than 0. Okay. So in other words, whenever you have something like this, if f of a b equals to f of a plus f of b, um, when you have a quotient, you can also write that f of a so f of, let's use x, uh, will be f of uh, x over y plus f of y. So f of x plus y, f of x over y is fx minus fy. So this more or less tells us what we want to do for all of the five options. Uh, f of 17 over 32 is f17 minus f32. Uh, f17 is 17. Uh, 32 is 2 to the 5. So f of 2 to the 5, uh, it behaves kind of like a logarithm, right? It becomes 5 times f of 2, which is what happens when you just split 32 into 2 and 16, and then 16 into 2 and 8, and you do that a few times. So this is 7, and that's positive. Uh, 11 over 16 is f11 minus f16, which is uh, 11 minus, this is 2 to the 4, so 4 times 2, which is 3. 
um, I can roughly see where this is going, uh, but let's just write it all out. Uh, 7 over 9 is uh, 7 minus 2 times 3, which is 1. Uh, we get faster and faster as we do it, uh, since we know how this works. f of 7 over 6 is 7 minus f of 6, which is uh, 7 minus 2 plus 3. That is 2. And finally, uh, 25 over 11 is 2 times 5 minus 11. Uh, this is the negative value. Okay. Alright, so we can continue. Uh, question 19. Uh, how many solutions does this have in the closed interval 0 to pi? Okay. Uh, this one is not so obvious. So we know that the thing inside um, is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And same for this. So that means that they are both in the first and fourth quadrant. In the first and fourth quadrant, cosine is definitely going to be positive. Oh no, this is 0 to pi. Okay, never mind. Uh, this is fine. So minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Uh, cosine is always going to be positive which means sine needs to be positive, and if that is the case, then uh, we don't have to worry too much about sine errors, I think. Uh, is that right? Uh, okay, so I should write this out a bit more properly. From 0 to pi, uh, so cos x um, it's going to go from 1 to negative 1 and sine x is just 0 to 1. So that means that this sine of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 um, but cosine is going to only be of 0 to pi over 2. Okay. So this one will be positive. It uh, means that I need this to be positive. So I have to make sure that my cosine is also positive. So must have cosine x from 0 to 1 first. And if cosine x is from 0 to 1, it means that we are only looking at actually the first quadrant. So x can only be from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so now that uh, x is from 0 to pi over 2, uh, it means that sine of zero to pi over two, and then you have cosine of uh, zero to pi over two. These are the two ranges, and everything is going to be from zero to one. Now, this is not actually being written in the correct direction because uh, for let's say uh, as x from 0 to pi over 2 then we know that pi over 2 cosine x will be decreasing and sine of something that's decreasing should be decreasing Uh, cosine of pi over 2 sine x. Uh, pi over 2 sine x is going to be increasing. And you take cosine of something increasing, oh, that's also decreasing. Okay, so that didn't quite work. Uh, because if they're both decreasing, then I can't use an argument that there's only one root. Let's try x equals to 0. I haven't tried the value. Uh, x equals to 0. Sine of pi over 2 times 1. Uh, and then this is cosine of pi over 2 times 0. Oh, okay, so those two are equal. 
All right, so because now, that makes sense. Uh, because sine and cosine, the angles inside are both in the first quadrant. So if they're both in the first quadrant, okay, let me clear a bit of space for myself. If they're both in the first quadrant, it means that the only way that this can happen is that they sum to pi over 2, 90 degrees. Okay. So it simplifies to cosine x plus sine x equals to 1. And we know that uh, sine x plus cosine x equals to 1. Uh, if we draw the unit circle, just that quadrant. The only time where you can get the x and y coordinate summing to 1 would be at these two places. So at 0 and pi over 2. So that means there should be those two solutions. And this is quite a nice problem, I would say. Right, how much time do I have left? Uh, I have uh, about 28 minutes for 6 questions. Oh no, a parabola one. Okay, I don't really remember much about uh, conic sections. Uh, let's draw it out anyway. So I guess I can assume that the parabola is uh, symmetric over the y-axis for convenience. Uh, so v is the vertex. Uh, there's a focus here. So you know that for a uh, parabola, uh, the all the points on it have to be equidistant from the focus and the directric sum line. Uh, so we can say that this line here, uh, this would be the directrix. Um, I don't really remember what's the importance of the directrix, unfortunately. So let's just try to solve the problem as it is. So A is somewhere here. Uh, and AF is 20, uh, AV is 21. Um, what is the sum of all possible lengths, values of the length FV? It sounds a bit more algebraic, uh, at least I'm not going to try to use my limited knowledge of conic sections. Um, I'll just know that A is equidistant from the focus and the directrix means that this distance um, should be also 20. Okay, so how can I make use of this? Okay, so what I'm thinking of is uh, I have to do this algebraically, so uh, let's just assume that this is positioned such that it is symmetric around the y-axis. Um, so the equation can be something like y equals to uh, ax squared plus b and this point would be 0b, uh, the focus would be at 0 to b. And this point A would be at uh, x. Let's not use, not, let's use uh, something like C. Okay. Um, actually, no. Uh, I know that the coordinate is uh, 20. So uh, I'll just call it C20. Uh, uh, and then since it's on this curve, uh, AC squared plus B equals to 20 means that C equals to. 20 minus b over a square root third plus or minus. Okay. Uh, I guess the plus or minus doesn't matter too much because this is uh, symmetric. So I'm just going to um, assume that it's the positive square root. I treat like the negative one though. Uh, so maybe I should use the negative square root. Okay, so I've not used the 20 or 21 anywhere here. 
So I guess I can form two equations and let's hope it's not too bad, shall we? So the distance from C20 to 0B, so C squared plus uh, root uh, 20 minus B, sorry, plus 20 minus B squared equals to 21 squared and the other length uh, is c squared plus 20 minus 2b squared well this is not too bad um, so there's probably some nicer way to do this but it's not coming to mind now so that's okay um, the two equations uh, i already think i can just subtract them because the only thing i care about is fv and fv is equal to b so i can subtract and i get the difference of these two squares which is the sum times the difference is equal to 21 squared minus 20 squared which is 41 okay so and now I can just use Vieta's formula. If I want the sum of roots, uh, there's two of them. This is a quadratic. So I'm not going to try to factorize it. Um, the coefficient is negative 3 and 40. So the sum of roots should be 40 over 3. Okay, I am none the wiser as to how this all worked out, but uh, it, it worked algebraically. So let's move on. Uh, 21. Oh no, another conic one. Uh, the five solutions uh, to this equation can be written in this form and then let epsilon be the unique ellipse that passes through these five points the eccentricity of epsilon is written in this form i'm going to skip this first because we're running short of time uh, question 22 suppose that the roots of this polynomial are cos 2 pi over 7 cos 4 pi over 7 and cos 6 pi over 7 uh, what's a b and c hmm. So I guess I'm going to just try to calculate each of them. Uh, there's most likely some clever way to do this using roots of unity, but I am not too sure. So I'm just going to write all these three down and we'll see if um, anything pops out. I'm going to try the middle one uh, because we can use a product to some formulas for all of that. So maybe you'll give me something and give me some idea what to do. Okay, so this will be half of cosine of the sum plus cosine of the difference. Uh, all of them have a difference that is quite related. So it is going to be... So this is 2 pi over 7 plus cosine... Um, 6 pi over 7 this one is cosine 8 pi over 7 plus cosine 4 pi over 7 and the third one is cosine um, 2 pi over 7 plus cosine 10 pi over 7 okay but uh, 6 pi over 7 and 8 pi over 7 um, those are equal uh, cosine 4 pi over 7 and cosine 10 pi over 7, those are so equal. So this is actually the same as the first one. Okay, that's interesting. So I still need to figure that out. Uh, and then the product as well. Uh, let's see whether we can simplify the product. 
So I'll simplify the first two. And then I will combine the first two again. The half cos sine 2 pi over 7 and cosine 6 pi over 7. space so I think I should just erase off some of these uh, and just write it down in terms of vietas. So this product was a negative C. Uh, this one here is a negative A and then this whole thing here is B. So, shall I continue with this? Uh, I am not sure whether this is going to simplify, uh, but I want to try to rewrite this using the double angle formula and see what it gives me. Right, so this would be half times uh, cosine 12 pi over 7 plus 1 over 2, so that would be over 4. Okay, so this becomes, uh, oh that's interesting, I'll just replace this here. Because this is interesting because 8 pi over 7 is the same as 6 pi over 7 and 12 pi over 7 is the same as 2 pi over 7. So this is actually just 1 quarter from here plus 1 quarter of this as well. So it all comes down to adding those three together. Ah, I think I got it. So cosine 2 pi over 7, cosine 4 pi over 7, cosine 6 pi over 7, I think we do have to use our roots of unity after all. So my drawing is fairly horrendous. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that these are the three that are going up. So we know that if we add this together, this should give me zero, right? Because that's all the real parts of these seven evenly spaced uh, complex numbers uh, and then this is 1 so if this is 1 it means that this whole thing is negative 1 and they come in pairs so if they come in pairs it means that these three should be negative half okay so that means that a is 1 half and uh, this is negative half so a is 1 half b is just going to be the same as that. So B is also equals to negative half. And C, negative C is equals to one quarter plus one quarter of negative half, which is one eighth. So C is negative one eighth. And the product is 1 over 32 few. Okay, so there's no negative 1 over 32. Uh, should be correct. How much time do we have left? Oh no, 14 minutes. Okay, so I guess we're not going to finish. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing this while talking and clearly it is not as easy as I expected. Okay, Frida the Frog begins a sequence of hops on a 3 by 3 grid of squares, moving one square on each hop and choosing at random the direction of each hop up, down, left or right. She does not hop diagonally. Uh, when the direction would take her off the grid, she wraps around and jumps to the opposite edge. Okay. Let's draw this out very quickly. 
and the drawing gets worse and worse as I'm running out of time. So you start from the center square uh, and then you're hoping to land on the corner square. Okay, so actually there are only three states down here. Um, there's the center, there's the edge, and there's the corner. Now you start here, from the center you're guaranteed to go to the edge. From the edge, there is a 50% chance that you end up at the corner, a one quarter chance you end up at the center, and a one quarter chance you end up back at yourself. Uh, if you're at a corner, then there is a half chance you end up at the edge, and there is a half chance you end up at yourself. So like that, we don't have to consider all of the nine places. We just have three different states. Okay. So the first time, uh, so after one hop, you are going to be at the edge for sure. From the edge, uh, for you to get there on the second hop uh, means that there is a uh, one half chance already. For you to end up there on the third hop means that you didn't end up at the corner, you ended up back at the edge. So it's one quarter, and then on the third one, you got to the corner, which is one half. Okay, so this means that uh, you ended up first at the corner. So you first ended up first at back at the edge, and then the corner. The fourth one, uh, you can end up at the edge, at the edge, then the corner. You can end up first at the edge, and then after that, to the center. But if you end up at the center on the... Okay, wait, uh, I think I'm messing things up. Okay, so let's write this a bit properly. You start, the first turn is the edge, and then after that, corner. So I'll put this, the corner as a tick. So this would be H, H, and then tick. This would be H, H, corner. This, oh yeah, that's already wrong because I'm trying to do it in four turns. Right? So the sequences that I want are either H, 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 and then get there. I go from the H to the center. And then after that, back to the edge, and then I finish. And that's really all, right? So H, 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 it would be one quarter, one quarter, and then one half. The edge, center, and edge, um, the edge is guaranteed, and then one quarter to get the center. 1 to get back to the edge, and then uh, half to get to the corner. Okay, so it's half, this is 1 eighth, this is um, 1 over 32 plus 1 eighth is 5 over 32, uh, and this plus this plus this is 25 over 32, which I am uh, probably only 70% sure I've done it correctly, but that's okay. Right, nine minutes. Let's try to do at least one or two more. Uh, question 24. The semicircle gamma has a diameter of length 14. They drew a full circle when they draw a full circle. Semicircle. Now circle omega lies tangent to this at a point P and intersects it at Q and R. Now, QR is uh, pretty small, so um, I take it as maybe the circle looks something like that. Horrible circle, but I'm running short of time.
Now it says that QPR is 60 degrees. Um, that at least looks vaguely believable. Okay, I think I have to really draw this again. This is getting too horrible. So let's try to make it look a bit better this time. It's not a good start already. <laughs> But I'm going to try to draw it off the center this time. Now that does not at all look like 60 degrees. Uh, this is fairly hopeless. Uh, let's try one more time. Or whatever. See what the question says first before I try again because this is um, fairly embarrassing. Maybe trying the other side will make my life better. I just make it dotted. And I'll pretend that that looks like 60 degrees. Okay, I think that's all the time I can afford. QR is square root, is 3 square root 3 and QPR is 60 degrees so actually I already will know how big this uh, semicircle sorry this circle is because if this is a 60 degree angle I think I should just draw it separately So if this is a 60 degree angle, it means that the angle to the center is 120 degrees. Uh, and if this length is 3 root 3, then we know that the ratio in a 120-30-30 triangle is 1-1 one, one root 3. So this just has a radius of 3. Now the problem is what am I supposed to do with the tangent? So let me think about that. Um, what do I do with the fact that I have a semicircle and that is also tangent? Six minutes. Okay, that is not good. Okay, uh, what I can try is to draw something like this. This is seven and seven, uh, and maybe I can find out some angle from that. What would the point of that be? Uh, I'm trying to find uh, PQR. Uh, I want to find one more side or one more angle so that I can get what I need for that. Okay. Let me take a look at the last question. So this is counting the number of positive integers that divide n, including itself. So this is just counting devices. And then a function is the thing divided by q root of n. And there's a unique integer. So you want to find the largest possible value of this fn, and they're asking you where it happens. OK, let me think. Now we know that the number of uh, positive integers to divide something uh, is basically going to be if you write it as p1 to the alpha 1 until pk to the alpha k um, it's just going to be alpha 1 plus 1 alpha 2 plus 1 until alpha k plus 1 So I'm going to think of it as every time when I introduce an extra 
prime factor in, I am introducing a multiplier on this. So let's see how it will affect it. So we start with 1. So dn is 1 and then uh, fn is still 1. That's the starting point. Now, when I introduce a new prime factor, I'm doubling. So when I introduce times 2, it means that now I have 2 to the 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. So the prime factors that I want to introduce, how do I write this? Um, if I want to double this, I can introduce in 2, 3, 5, and 7. Because each of these will just give me a q root of 2, a q root of 3, and uh, q root of 5, q root of 7. All of these are less than 2. So this is something I want to add on. And then now if I want to see are there any other prime factors that I want to multiply in again? Uh, if I multiply anything, it is times 3 over 2. Now 1.5 cubed is 3.375. Meaning that if I introduce in 2 or 3, both of those cube roots are going to be smaller than 3 over 2. Okay. And then let's say that now I decide to add in another one, which is times 4 over 3. Uh, this is 64 over 27, so I can fit in another 2. But uh, actually wait, uh, I don't need to do any further because I see that 3 has appeared twice. So the sum of digits has to be 9 already. Uh, so that will have to do. Okay, so which questions did I leave? Uh, I left 24 and 21. Um, is there any uh, reasonable way I can get 24 quickly? Let's look at it just for a second more. So I don't want to draw the circles anymore. Uh, I'm just going to uh, put my points and then I'll see how it looks like. So A, B, let's say there's a center O, there is P, there's another center, and then there's two other points. Uh, Q and R on this semicircle. This is 3, 3 and 3, and then the distance here is 7, the distance from O to this are all 7. Okay, so is there anything I can do very quickly? Oh no, I am running, completely running out of time. Right, so I guess I should just uh, tap out here. Uh, this means that I have done 23 of the 25 questions within the time that we have been allotted. Okay, so that's decent uh, for a first attempt. Now let me check my answers for those that I did. Uh, and uh, I guess what I can do is to upload a second video after this to um, slowly explain a few of the more interesting questions um, since we have just blasted through this like a freight train. Okay, so let's check the answers. Uh, the first five are B, D, 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 E. So this is correct, it's correct, this is correct, this is correct, and good, the first five are correct. Let's check the next few. So 6 through 10 are C, D, C, C, E.
Good. So, so far, so good. Question 11 to 15. C A B E D. Good. Still okay. It looks like my calculation hasn't failed me for those big messes. Next five. C D E C B. C D E C and B. Oh, okay. So that was indeed fine. Now the last five. A D D D E. Um, I left this blank and I, in fact I forgot to even snip the options. Oh well. So this is D. D. Left that blank and E. Good. So uh, it looks like all the questions which I attempted were actually correct. Uh, and the only ones that uh, I didn't complete uh, were 21, which I skipped because I've forgotten too much about uh, conic sections, and 24 because uh, my mind did not find anything interesting about this within a couple of minutes. Okay, so just uh, to say a few things, right? if you are still watching this here, uh, thank you very much for listening to my stream of consciousness. I wanted to give you a sense of the chaos and the hectic nature of solving. And because for a lot of the other um, videos that I've shot and lots of other videos uh, anywhere, um, there's a nice script in front of us. Uh, we have worked out all the questions in advance. Uh, for the SMO videos, the live stream that I did, uh, I hadn't written out the videos, but I made sure I knew how to solve the questions before the live stream. Now, in this case, I did not really look at the questions apart from copying them in here, which means that there was a risk of embarrassment, and uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that it has been limited to just leaving two questions blank. So, see that this is a really hectic task, and it is very different in character from something like the proving based problems that we look at in some of our other videos and that you might do at a higher level or in different contests, whether it be the second round of the SMO, whether it be the USAMO or USAJMO or other proving based competitions around the world. So you need to almost be able to switch your mode to whichever kind of time control you're working under. If you're working under these kinds of constraints, uh, you have to just abandon any pretense of writing neatly. Um, I'm already being a bit neater than I would be in a contest. Uh, now I'm trying to make sure that the video isn't completely pointless. If it was just a smattering of working everywhere, that would be even worse. So I'll follow up with another video um, to hopefully go through a few of the interesting problems more carefully. Um, if I were to just look at the last 10 questions, right? Uh, 16 is okay. Um, 17 should be fine. And 18. Um, so I think I will try to explain 19. And uh, 19 is fine. Uh, 21 I did not do at all. So I definitely need to... Uh, remind myself to do that. Uh, 22 also, I'll try to write it out a bit more neatly because that was a humongous mess. Uh, 23 as well, because the idea is simple, but I don't think the cases made a lot of sense when doing it live. Uh, 24, because I haven't actually completed it yet. And I guess um, the last one as well, because uh, this looks like uh, the ramblings of a madman. Right, so that means that uh, question 19 and 21 to 25, uh, I'll follow up with another video to explain a bit more carefully. Uh, if you have any questions about um, those in front, uh, which I just uh, zoomed through as quickly as possible, please feel free to leave it in the comments below. And if you think there was a better method for some of these or you have any other suggestions, uh, please feedback as well. Now, finally, uh, if you are still here, um, that's really great, thank you, and uh, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, uh, leave a comment, and uh, yeah, I hope that this was interesting in some way. So thank you very much, uh, we'll be back to uh, 
some other of our usual programming on problem solving once I've finished preparing the video for that. So thank you and see you again next time.